Isabel, what vocal mic should I buy? This has got to be the most common question I'm asked by my students and podcast listeners, hands down. And I get it. Investing in a mic can feel like a big deal. There's so many options to choose from now and everyone you ask will give you a different recommendation. What's a girl to do? And that's why I've created a quick, easy 45 second quiz where you'll be matched with your perfect vocal mic. You'll tell me about your voice, your setup, your needs and your budget and I'll pair you with a vocal mic that's your perfect fit. No more trawling through the internet, scrolling through thousands of online reviews and losing all sense of time and space. And did I mention you'll even receive a free bonus video I recorded in my very own home studio showing you how to position your mic for your best sounding recordings yet. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz and get your hands on all of this. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz and get ready to meet your perfect vocal mic. Uh, there was, I won't name any names, but there was one band turned up and they were obviously high as a kite. Mm. And um, I just said, lads, just get back in the car because you're not wasting my time. I'm not I'm not giving you this time. It's, it's not mm. worth it. Mm. Um, you know, rebook another time if you wish, but I'm not, I'm not working with people mm. <laughs> that are like that. My time's too precious. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel, and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female-identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Before we get started, I just want to let you know about my awesome three-step guide to sound treating your recording space. It's the perfect accompaniment to this week's episode and totally free to download. Just head to femalediymusician.com forward slash zero seven. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash zero seven to grab your guide now. So it's Christmas Eve. And while I know not everyone listening to this podcast will celebrate Christmas, and most likely even less of you actually identify as Christian, I hope that you're at the very least enjoying a little winter downtime. Now, I could have given you a cheesy Christmas themed episode today. I am a sucker for all things Christmas after all. But instead, I thought I'd just give you a little gift. A wonderful guest episode where I sit down and pick the brains of a true expert in sound and analogue recording, Julie McLarnon. Now, Julie has been recording to tape for over 30 years and has worked with so many incredible artists such as Brian Eno, The Fool, The Charlatans and New Order, to name but a few. Judy says, I'm still in constant passionate pursuit of beautiful sonic art, always in service to the song. Everything about the analogue environment is inspirational and conductive to creativity. Judy founded her studio, Analogue Catalogue, a totally vintage analogue recording studio set within the beautiful Moor Mountains of Northern Ireland. And in this episode, we talk about this, her experience as a female engineer and producer and her top tips for recording in the studio. It's a blinder, so let's dive in. Hello, Julie. Thank you so much for coming on Girls Twiddling Knobs. No worries. We've got so much that I'd love to talk to you about. Um, I know that you've got some really great tips for people going into studios, which we're going to get to towards the end of our chat. But first, I just watched the wonderful documentary that you've made um, about the psychology of analogue. Um alongside Miles O'Reilly, the film filmmaker. Uh-huh. Um, and one of the things I noticed um, was you have the Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt oblique strategies. Yes. So I thought I that I have that too. <laughs> and I, I took out my box and I thought, why don't I pick a card for me and Julie's episode? Right. Uh, so do you want to hear what Mine it is? Mine in the other room. Go oh, on. really? What, what, okay. what is it? Yeah. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll read it now and then we can okay. see if, by the end of the the episode, we've managed to kind of in some way harness this. So um, for anyone who doesn't know what this is, it's a box full of um, very kind of 
oh, how would you call it? Philosophical, abstract, creative ways to to just give yourself some kind of inspiration or some some kind of focus or intention for what you're doing creatively. Yeah. Um, so the, the card I've picked for us, Julie, is go to an extreme, move back to a more comfortable place. Oh, yes, I know that one. <laughs> I know that one. It's funny you should mention those, actually, because um, we're putting out, when I say we, Animal Catalogue, my little record label, is um, putting out a kind of gift box uh, next month um, with a cassette in it. And I've actually made for it a fortune teller. You know those <gasps> kids' paper fortune tellers? Yes. Based on on the, the, the Brian Eno concept, but with way more, because I was always disappointed with the Brian Eno thing. I expected <laughs> to get get those cards in it to go go to channel nine and just erase everything you know oh, I, I expected wow. it to be really precise yes, yeah. and um so I've made a fortune teller um that's going to be in this gift box with the cassette that you you can make up and you know ask it um answers and obviously it can't have like the the god knows how many cards are in the Brian Eno thing yeah. it's only got eight answers in it but it's eight production tips Lovely. in there that are more precise that are more like you know put a delay on the (laughs) hi-hat amazing oh I love that I love that so and also it's kind of nice there only being eight because you I don't know like I I, well again after watching the the great documentary you talk in that about constraints and creativity and I think that yeah whenever there's a multitude of of um options it's so easy if you've got say you know in the, the oblique strategies there's I don't know how many there are like a hundred or something um, yeah there must be a, probably about yeah it feels like there's a, over 50 it feels thicker yeah. than a normal pack of cards so it there must be like 70 cards or something at least yeah absolutely and so you pick one and you're like oh, I don't like that one I'll pick another one I'll pick another yeah. one I'll pick another yeah. one um whereas if there's eight it's like oh okay uh that's it then just do as you tell. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, Cho- I've got a... Choice paralysis and, and yes. the analogue um, environment. I think yes. it's my specialist subject. <laughs> yes, and I'd love to talk more about that for sure. Um, just in case anybody's listening and they're like, oh shit, I love the sound of Judy's box. How, what, how do they get that? What, where is that going to be? That hopefully, uh, if all the bits arrive on time, the cassette, etc., um, and a fabric patch and stuff, it's going to be on Bandcamp on the next Bandcamp day. Um, yeah. So on the analog catalogue Bandcamp, um, it'll be. We've mixed the tape as well, so it is a mixtape. It, it it goes like from one track seamlessly into the other one with little bits oh. in between and stuff. So it's not just like a song a stop, a song a stop. It's yeah. all totally mixed in. Oh wow! Um, so it'll be yeah, it'll be. There's there's going to be. Um, I think 80 of them and they're going to go um, on the band camp day in July amazing that sounds great okay well look we're definitely going to put a link to that in the show notes for the episode so I'm sure by the time this goes out that will be available for people to get um, if they Uh want that Cool. Okay. Well, look, Julie, let's get into um, your story. Um, Let's start at the beginning, shall we? So I was fascinated to hear and and learn a bit about how you started to, without knowing it really, train your ears because of being in hospital as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I ended up, um, I I got meningitis septicemia and I got very sick and I was in hospital for... um, on and off for from I was five till I was about 11. Um, back then there was certainly no internet, there wasn't even any tellies or anything, it was just a, a radio, just a, a medium wave radio. Um, and where I realised I'd done is I'd just grown up with this absolute obsession and love and interest in music and, and the production in it, sort of analysing. And it was the dawn of, of um, synths as well, because it was like the the late 70s going into the early 80s. So you'd you'd hear a new song that had just been released and you'd be like, that is a new sound I have never, never heard before. And it because, you know, a Prophet 5 had just been invented or, um, you know, a Poly 6 or... Like, it, it, it would be because there was a new piece of kit on the market um, and you'd be hearing it. And I guess I just grew up with this knowledge of the history of synthesizers and recording techniques without really realising it or trying. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, 
Do, when you say the history of synthesizers, but also recording techniques, is that because as a kid you were picking up how it was changing? Yeah, I was. I was able to sort of see. Yeah, that's that sound, but that's that sound with delay, or that's mm. that sound with reverb, and then you know investigating what these things meant, what what tape delays were, what digital delays were as they were being invented, um, etc. So I just became um, obsessed with the. The, the technology around multi-track recording um, rising from 16 into 24 track um, and yeah I was lucky enough that I was working in professional recording studios when I, before digital recording was a thing mm-hmm. um, I was kind of in there from from the late 80s um, we had the dash system but it, it didn't really take off uh, so everything was just to analog tape um, so I have very much analog ears you know I don't um, I still actually had somebody set this this computer up for me to even do this interview. <laughs> I've never recorded anything to a computer. Yeah. Um, and I'm just kind of allergic to it. Yeah. No, that's so interesting because I think that um, something that I find a lot when I'm working with women um, in terms of recording and production, there's a lot of aversion to technology. Um but I think that it's really important to note that there will be different types of technology that you are drawn to, and it's okay if there's other types that you're not that just don't click with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think like I'm 49 the other day, um, so like people younger than myself have grown up with computers. They're really super comfortable with them, um, and I see the fear in their eyes when I show you know a 20 year old a massive tape machine. Yeah. Um, but I'm just the other way around, you know. Yeah. I'm totally comfortable with with big analog desks and I'm patch bays and and tape machines. And as soon as you know a computer's in front of me, I struggle to even send an email. So it just depends what you've grown up with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do think there's something about um, the way that your brain is wired, or just the taste that you have, or just the way that something fits with you. You know, it's it's like the same with instruments. You could love playing the violin, hate playing the clarinet, and just different things fit with different people. Yeah, I think with any type of creativity is be true to yourself as to what you like as opposed to what you can do, you know, in the same way that you shouldn't try and create graphic design by walking to the computer and just being, you know, just doodling around on, on the buttons and the mouse. You should kind of do it on paper. And um, I think... It's the same, you know, if you, if you really like grime music or you really like something, a genre that's just grown up in digital, then digital is for you. And that's where you're going to be able to emulate the sounds that you love and that you're going to be able to make the art that you want to make. But if you're sat there obsessed with a Blondie record or a Pill record or, you know, a Cure record, you're going to be struggling to get those sounds in the digital domain you are much better using the tools that those things were created with and it it falls into place so easily when you use the same tools as were used for those kind of records so it really just depends where you're coming from yeah totally um cool okay well um maybe you can just uh, share a little bit about how you got into working in studios in the first place then um yeah i mean i i went to the George Martin School of Recording at Salford um, Polytechnic, which was a short run sort of thing, which I was so lucky because the actual course teacher was Bill Leader, who is a famous, legendary, award-winning um, producer in his own right. Um, and it it, um, it was just a, a kind of a blip in time um, that, that they ran this course at Salford Poly um, for 16-year-olds, like straight from school. Um, and then from there, uh, I only did like a year of that. And then at 17, I went to, um, I think, no, I, yeah, it was just before I was 18. I went to, um, I went to Strawberry Studios for my summer work placement and ended up n- not going back to college. I just, um, stayed at Strawberry Studios, ended up, um, assisting for the BBC and Martin Hannett and New Order and, um, Chris Nagel, um, Ian Brody, all sorts of people. Wow. Andy Weatherhall. Incredible. Um, so yeah, that was that was me through the doors, very young, and um, 
and carried on working in studios ever since. Brilliant. Um, so when you were studying um, and you were actually learning engineering and production, I'm presuming, or was it, was it just engineering? In a that, kind of... that course was, um, they're actually bringing things, when I say they, I should uh, clarify, uh, it's now called James because Lippa um, and the George Martin um, thing um, uh, came together under the under the brand James, which is joint audio something or other. Um, and they their courses for engineering for studio stuff is very very technical. And certainly back then that that uh, prototype course um, was um, was sort of part maths, part physics and acoustics, part electronics, and any of the um sort of recording stuff was only put into practice what you'd learnt um on the electronics and the acoustics side of things but you definitely needed your physics and acoustics and your understanding what the sound is doing and then what the electronics that you're pointing at that sound whether it be the microphone uh, the preamp whatever what those things are bringing to the table so it was an in-depth um you know understanding of every component in the chain through to the speakers um so it, it was quite different to the way i see people getting taught on production stuff now mm. where they're more user yeah um uh, rather than you know i actually know what's inside that speaker i know what's inside that mic i know why this room reflects like this yeah um so yeah it was quite it was quite different to the the, the production music production courses mm. that people might be familiar with these days yeah, it's really interesting you said, because it, it really reminds me of, I did my MA at the Sonic Arts Research Centre, and um, a lot of what we studied was very mathematical and very physics-based, like you describe, and really understanding, you know, spatial audio, psychoacoustics, um, and and knowing how maths is a language to describe sound, and all yeah. those things, and, um, and, but yeah, it's, it's true that now a lot of the time production is taught just in a computer. Yeah, and and I don't know. I don't. I think that when you're, if you're studying the production and engineering side of thing, you're carving frequencies. So it's all about frequencies. So you should you should really just learn the piano in its number format. You know, mm. like that key is eighty eight point two hertz, and that key up there, that's you know, you should know all your hertz associated with the with the eight octaves on a piano, and all your hertz associated, obviously, with the other things, the the rack toms, the floor toms, the the other things that you're going to be maybe miking, so that you um that that knowledge is in the same way that you'd turn around to a child and say, would well, you just learn your times tables? You're going to need it in life. You know, it, it, if that knowledge is just in there, like your alphabet, like your times tables, you can draw upon it without even thinking. Mm. You just hear a sound and you think, right, it's fundamentals at such a hertz, but it's got a nice harmonic at such a hertz and I can deal with that because that one's not clashing with that instrument that's over there. Mm. Um uh, you know, you're able to just break it down to its mathematical components and deal with it without the... I, I see some people approach a desk and they're just turning every knob, hoping they get lucky. You know, you shouldn't be. You should just walk to a desk and just know, like, be doing a couple of mils in that direction and half a millimetre in that direction because you're just gently carving what you need out of those EQs to, to, to make those frequencies fit together like a jigsaw. Mm. Yeah, and... um. I think that would probably be quite intimidating to a lot of people. You know, how do you get your head around that stuff? Um, again, it's just it's just training and that in the same way, how do you learn to play a piano or how yeah. do you know A to Z? You know, it's it's ne seeing a piano and thinking of it in its number format, seeing hearing sound and thinking of it instead of, oh, I think that's middle C, you know, saying, mm. oh, I think that's 282. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it's like, you know, just knowing your basic frequencies and being able to recognise them, not dead on to the, you know, to the actual number, but more or less so that, you know, because even when you go to a desk, you can't go in and, and take out, you know, 342.6 on, on an analogue desk, mm -hmm. but you can go in and know, I've got a hump around 300 that I really kind of need to just take 3 dB off here. And suddenly, when you know that, when you're approaching it, not with luck of going, oh, I don't know what it is, something sounds 
lumpy, something sounds cloudy, um, you know what it is. You've recognised it, so you just go in and lift it straight out. And it, it is just that constant conversation in the same way that how do you learn another language? How do you learn to read music? It's just constantly thinking about frequencies and associating them with their their number. Yeah, so um, just coming back to when you were learning um, all of these different techniques, um, I have to ask, it being girls twiddling knobs, were they the only women on the course or were there more women um, with you learning? No. There was, let me think, three or four of us. Uh huh. Yeah, there was. I'm probably the only one that's still professionally, um, professionally, you know, working in studios. Um, but there was three or four of us. So, out of a class of maybe twenty eight or something. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of. I I don't get to. Um, I don't expect to see this job 50 50 um in the same way that i don't expect to take my car in for new brake pads and expect to see 50 50 mechanics female male i think there's a lot of tech involved and it just doesn't appeal to um to every female um and that would i don't know enough to know whether that's um social conditioning that they've been raised you know to think they can't do that or whether they just genuinely don't like it as a mother of two girls one of which is studying um you know astrophysics and is very tacky and the other one of which is very artsy and loves fashion and stuff i think it's just genetic and i think you should just let people be um I think some people wake up and they're born loving all things technical, mechanical, whatever, and some people aren't. Mm, yeah, and I think it's a it's a debate that's very complicated, and like you say, it, it's difficult to kind of just sum it up. Um, I think personally, I feel like um, on the one hand, it's true, you know, you, you are naturally drawn to certain things. On the other hand, we have to make sure that those environments are open. Um, and, you know, I think there's not just a question of, of gender, but race and disability and sexuality. And um, there is no doubt that studios in particular, I think, are, are not very diverse in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think it's a combination. Um, but it's just interesting. Um, I very rarely talk to someone who, yeah, who says I was one of many women on a course about uh, production or recording. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> certainly, yeah. You, uh, I I would say, I've even I did a workshop with Mandy Parnell about um, mastering, um, and it was part of um, Women's Week in Belfast. Oh yes, oh yes, centre. Yeah, yeah. The entire I think it was two females in the audience that oh, the ninety odd percent of yeah. the room was male. We just had to, you know, I just sort of said welcome ladies <laughs> and they all these bearded guys just kind of laughed like you yeah, are we all right to be here is it okay no it's women's week yeah <laughs> but it's you know at the end of the day those are the people that were really interested in the in in, in the, the technical information mm. of of um of how you how you master something and get it to manufacturing mm. yeah um and possibly those are the people who have been in groups of people who talk about this stuff and yeah. you know share that information and I think a lot of women if they are even have a little interest it just it's harder to get that off the ground internally um if you're not surrounded by other people who are also interested or talking about it um but yeah I had this conversation ahead of this with my assistant who's female mm -hmm. female Asian and French Mm -hmm. um, you know the the other element apart from the fact that I'd spent my childhood listening to the radio I'm the daughter of a mechanic mm. and I'd grown up in a garage yeah. um, surrounded he, he, he owned the garage but I spent my weekends from I was like three surrounded by blokes and um, and technical stuff getting fixed Yeah. so I wasn't afraid of it I didn't see it as if my dad could have had his way he would have just 
given me the business and I would have carried on being, you know, owning the garage. Mm. Um, he never treated me like a girl. Um, and I got an inside track on the male environment and the male psyche from I was no age, mm. which absolutely helped me not have any kind of insecurities around male um, environments, male-dominated environments. Yeah. So when I was in recording studios as a teen, I wasn't the sort of girl that was asking myself, what did he mean? Is he yeah. looking at this? Is he looking at... I didn't have any... I was so done with that. I, I treated, you know, guys the way you know, I understood them I understood yeah. what goes on there I had an inside information on it and it just didn't take up part of my brain mm. thinking uh, any any feelings of insecurity or, or trying to second guess them um I, I just was one of the lads from day one because I'd been raised to be one of the lads mm. um so I think that that helped and I try and do that with my own daughters you know mm -hmm. I don't put any gender um gender barriers up at all and and tell them you know you should get out there and mix concrete as well if you want to get out there mm. and mix concrete don't don't think that anything's a, a guy's job every job's for whoever wants to do it and enjoys doing it yeah absolutely um no it's really interesting hearing actually that you grew up in the environment and that it, that makes so much sense that then when you would come to technology and music you would not feel that pang of oh should I be here or am I going to be exposed as a, a an idiot or a fraud or all those feelings that a lot of the time I know you know women can have in that situation yeah that imposter syndrome thing yeah is, it is really a problem for females isn't it and I'm not saying that I have never um felt that I think everybody has self-doubt I think yeah. it's it, I think you would be kind of falling into into um in, into sort of a bracket of, of some kind of psychotic person if you yeah. didn't have self-doubt <laughs> I'm sure it's perfectly healthy and necessary yes. yeah um to to question what you're doing in life um but at the same time uh yeah I I I think it did definitely help me to to be exposed to the male to see how the guys do it and yeah. how, you know, and I know that those those stats on on a recent, um, well, not that recent now, I suppose it was a few years ago, that sort of exposed that if a female goes for a job and she's like pretty much 100% qualified, she'll still have self-doubt, where mm. a guy will go for the same job who's probably 60% qualified and he won't have any self-doubt and he'll think he's going to get it. Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, that 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 is there, and yes, if you have got daughters, do breed it out of them. And if you have got it yourself, breed it out of yourself because yeah. that's what you're up against, you know. You're up yeah. against that guy who's 60% proficient and thinks that he um, thinks he's better than you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I, I think one of the things that can be really difficult is when even if you're doing all that internal work, um, you still come up against sort of judgment or ignorance. And one example is... I teach um, creative sound studies at BIM in London in the music uh -huh. production department. And I have a PhD in sonic arts. I have self-released and self-produced four albums, which have over 25 million Spotify streams. And yet when I played one of my songs, one of my young 19 year old male students asked me, did you produce that then? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm fucking teaching you music production. I'm teaching you creative sound studies. Yes, I did. Why do you think I'm here? And like another one on another occasion asked me, so do you do you make music then and like record and produce it? I'm like, yes. Yeah. Why would they employ me? <laughs> Why would they make me teach I, you this stuff? You know? I, I know what you mean, but I've also had, you know, I've had both male and female if I had a pound literally for every time anyone's walked in front of me at a big mixing desk and gone do you know what all those knobs do oh, yeah. <laughs> I just hear it all the time yeah, yeah. and they are just I don't know it seems like rocket science doesn't it to people especially if they're very young it seems like rocket science mm -hmm. um and if they're I don't know do you think that that's definitely do you do you still see a lot of sexism um... yeah I think it's I, I think that like say when that, that you know those two different male students basically were not sure whether I produced music or not 
right. you know my music there's no there's no malice malice behind it but it's entrenched sexism that yeah if i was a male tutor who had a phd in sonic arts had self-released and self-produced um albums that had gone on to you know have millions of spotify streams and they were teaching them within their music production course there's no way they doubt that they they made music yeah yeah there's just no way yet it because i'm a woman um and i'm not saying it's just men that have these presumptions um you know of course like there could be a girl in that class that could have asked me that but all of the girls actually immediately were like boom she's the woman that makes music with technology yeah. And for them, it was like almost like a beacon, whereas for the guys, Mm -hmm. not all of them, but just those one or two that expressed this anyway, they weren't clear that I actually was was walking the talk. It was almost like they presumed maybe I'd just be given a script by BIM to read off <laughs> all right <laughs> you know <laughs> this is this yeah yeah you're just just yeah. like a history teacher yeah this is this yeah let's get on with it absolutely um uh the thing that is um that that i i've always found i'm hoping it's getting easier but the thing that i've found that is just part of the male psyche and i, d- I don't like being sexist towards towards guys um but is their ability to think they did something that maybe they didn't do, that that <laughs> girl did. Um, oh Jesus, yes. Uh, and they, I don't, I I don't think they honestly know they're doing it no. a lot of the time. No, no. I no. think that they just, uh, you know, I don't think that they maliciously uh, know that they do. Sometimes they do maliciously know that they're doing it, but often they don't. And I think that as soon as you realise that um, guys will accidentally just take credit where it's not due to them um you have to be a little bit defensive and a little bit upfront about what you've done and mm. say uh, you know you do realize i just wrote that bit and <gasps> um you do realize i just gave you all those production ideas yeah. and uh you you know my name better appear there please um because yeah i think it is part of their psyche to just think that they did everything themselves Mm. no that's I mean I think that's a really interesting one and I think that a lot of women struggle with well how do I do that how do I say actually I did that because I think a lot of the time um well some women are struggling with that being a nice girl problem (laughs) how do I be a nice girl and also stand up for myself yeah and women are afraid of yeah there's yeah it's the old if a guy sort of up front and shouts a lot then he's a strong guy and if a girl does mm. she's a b-i-t-c-h yeah mm. i know mm. um so it, it is it is hard that you, you do have to kind of smile at them and sort of go just make sure that my name's on that or, you know mm. try and put a bit of humor in it and <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I think you're right it's like developing that clear but firm voice isn't it that kind of calm firmness yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I mean, I think also um, I've definitely got better at that since I've been raising kids, since I've been a mother. Mm. I think as a as a youngster, um, I would have let most of my credits slip away um, and not think that, you know, think, well, if I was worthy of it, somebody would knock on my door and give me it. Mm. And that isn't the way it works. But I think that, you know, when you do become a fully blown adult and you've got the responsibility of, of, of man management of, of, of your kids then you just get better at man management and and mm. organizing things and so I think that was actually um and the age as well just being like often 20 years older than the people that I'm working with I'm just able to turn around now and go yeah that's mine <laughs> so <laughs> yeah hands off <laughs> <laughs> I made that yeah. so you know make sure mm. you you tell everyone I think that's um, that's really interesting that you mention how motherhood has changed, you know, how that how you um just feel more confident um saying saying what you believe or um telling people if they've maybe stepped out of line even if they didn't mean to. Um yeah, did you notice that happen quite immediately after becoming a mother or is it something that's gradually no, grown? I think I think you just grow into it. Um I never taught, so you might have you know, you, you, maybe people like yourself that teach pick up those skills quite quickly mm. if you're trying to organise a class. Mm-hmm. But I never was in a classroom situation. I've always been in a, in a studio situation. So I think those sort of classroom 
techniques of trying to trying to get three kids to do something and get the shoes on and get in the back of the car does sort of translate quite it's quite good for also trying to get a drummer to to put the phone down and and focus and get on with the job yeah yeah <laughs> you know it's you do just sort of and I think also you you shift what's important to you in life and you just sort of think look, look if I'm in this studio for 15 hours today um don't be wasting my time because that's 15 hours I'm not with my kids yeah and so you get a little bit of a shorter fuse on things and you you kind of want stuff done and you want people to value your time um and your input and not just you don't you know where when I was 17 or 18 if I had to sit there whilst musicians were being musicians mm. and not doing stuff as fast as they could be I wasn't as conscious you know I wasn't like this is my time would you yeah would you use it well please yeah um so I think that that that's just something that naturally comes to you if you're if you're being dragged away from from where where you think you, you'd be in torn emotionally you'd be in torn mm. like actually I kind of would like to be here um so you do get a little bit of a a little bit more organized to make sure that your time in the work workplace is totally productive yeah yeah I think that's a really interesting one of just that you really value your time you know and and I I think that that's probably the case for any mother I think Mm. you know head of whatever marketing mother with three or four kids at home probably is more efficient than she was before she had those kids. Like yes. I think she just knows if I'm not at home, I I need to be making sure that I make that this is this is not wasting my time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean when when you you were saying, you know, that you hadn't taught and but but being a mother had developed these skills and when I think about I'm not a mother, but I teach a lot now. Yeah, and yeah. what it's developed to me and I don't know whether it's the same for you um, with motherhood and then working in the studio, but for me, it's helped me to to um, to not identify so much with those conversations. So I don't judge myself by how other people re- react to me as much because when you're up there teaching, um, you have to you have to you come into contact with so many people all throughout the day, like maybe up to a hundred students in a day that you start to see patterns and you start to see that it's actually very little of people's reactions are about you. Most yeah. of them are about them and what's going on with them. And I think I'd that's... i say it, teenage years especially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't exist. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And you just have to kind of embrace that and think, oh, you know, it, wouldn't it be nice if I could go back and be a teenager just for 24 hours, just for the kit, for the hell of it? Oh, God, no. Um, <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> I'm much happier in my 30s, I think. But <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it's so self obsessed. Yeah. That, yeah. To yeah. not have a care about anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think, um, but I think there's a lot in that of just, yeah, valuing your time and also not over identifying with other people's reactions. And I think that can really help you to get more confident and assertive about your yeah. boundaries, essentially, you know. And what you need yeah. to take out of that experience in the studio. When I was training Elise, um, my, my my assistant, uh, there was, I won't name any names, but one band turned <laughs> up and they were obviously high as a kite. Mm. And um, I just said, lads, just get back in the car because you're not wasting my time. I'm not I'm not giving you this time. It's, it's not mm. worth it. Mm. Um, you know, rebook another time if you wish, but I'm not I'm not working with people mm. <laughs> that are like that. My time's too precious. So, yeah. um, you know, it wasn't even a band that I was going to be doing. I was just going to be helping Elise um, in, in her training. Yeah. Um, but I was just like, yeah, I'm not training you with those guys today. Go and get me yeah. something else. <laughs> Yeah, and I think a lot of people would be, feel really not comfortable doing that because they'd be like, oh, I'm not going to look rock and roll enough. I'm not going to look kind of cool enough. Isn't yeah. that just what musicians do? But I love the fact that you're like, no, we are not going to get your best work and that's yeah. not worth our time. And and it, it's not fair on it's not fair on Elise either yeah. that she she would um, be having to, to deal with all that. You know, it's not it's not necessary in in the music industry these days to be tolerating all that. And I wouldn't have been comfortable, um, having been there and grown up in that atmosphere. I wouldn't have been comfortable leaving, um, you know, a young twenty something at that point in her career, quite inexperienced girl, uh, with a load of lads who are high. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, as a mother, wouldn't wouldn't allow that to happen. Yeah. Um. So you know, that kind of 
th- those are those are the good things that come with being old. Yeah. Your ability to just go, I'm calling this. No, I'm not tolerating this anymore. Um, actually, I had um, a conversation with um, um, with um, the the woman who used to be the bookings manager at uh, Trident Studios in the seventies, and I was obsessed with Trident Studios. Mm. I still am. Um, and she said to me um, once, "Oh, I would never have let a daughter of mine be in that studio. You know, in in that atmosphere wow. in the seventies and eighties, like in the studio, it wasn't safe for a girl." And I think it probably, uh, it probably, she's probably right. Like Mm. as much as I wanted to be there and as much as I was super lucky with the people that I was surrounded by, you know, uh, who were always very respectful to me. And um, I never had any any of the the horror stories, the kind of me too horror stories that Mm. you do here. Um, But I'm still I'm still conscious that that rock and roll element of um, of of you know, late nights and caning, drinking drugs and stuff, I just try and keep it out of the studio. Yeah. You know, I just don't... I think that the time has passed when that's acceptable, really. Mm. You know, if you want to make good records, you really need to be on on, on your game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, no, I mean, I think it's it just goes to show how this may be a reason why some women are not attracted to, you know, that line of work. Um, just not for everyone, but just that that narrative about the studio being somewhere where you pull all nighters and you're you know pissed and you're on drugs yeah. and yeah um, and it's and it's all guys mucking around and somehow out of two weeks and thousands of pounds or more than two weeks for bit <laughs> you know back in the day yeah. um, thousands of pounds you pull a record out of the debauchery absolutely I mean that's that's the the atmosphere that. Um... That I kind of grew up in, you know. I worked in a residential studio as well for like four years, where um, and this is a residential analog catalog is now a residential, um, but a residential in the early nineties where you had like I basically lived with napalm death and bands like that for weeks on end, um, and it, <laughs> wow, <laughs> it was yeah, <laughs> it, you can imagine yeah. what it was like, um, and I can I can sort of. I'm okay because I I was a pretty strong person and could hold my own. And as I said, it was always whether it was whether it was Hannah or or uh, Nagel or Colin Richardson, always really super nice mm. guys that were always always had your back. Um, so I was kind of lucky, but yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be throwing my daughters into that and, yeah. and not knowing what was going on, you know, yeah, um, or not worrying. Um, and certainly, uh, I I've seen females um, assistants come and go that have been seduced by um, and and sometimes them wanting that to yeah. happen, you know. Yeah. But it, it it has, but they've not been strong, like mm. you know that that kind of just don't go there never yeah. sleep with a client never get yeah. into a relationship with yeah. a client ever um you know is uh, luckily i was always my my um my stance it it wouldn't it's not 9 to 5 you know it's not yeah. it's not it's not unionized and 9 to 5 <laughs> yeah 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 so you kind of have to make those boundaries yourself really don't you oh yeah and yeah. be clear on them yeah yeah absolutely absolutely well, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about your studio, Julie, and how you came to uh-huh. set up a studio in in Newry, which is beautiful. That you know the Morn area, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did that come about? Um, well, my dad was originally from Belfast, and then he was um, he was moved out to Rostrava um, after the war or during the war. He was one of those kids, and um, so he grew up in Rostrava, which is just on the coast there. Uh, on Carlingford Lock, um, and he then bought a little, um, a little retirement home there. And then when he passed, I had to deal with that and come over and deal with the paperwork and stuff. And I just accidentally saw the um, the the advertisement for this property I'm sat in now, and it was sort of post crash, and they they couldn't get rid of it. 
and I went and looked at it and a vision of of a utopian analog recording residential complex appeared in my mind and I just threw in a cheeky bid and thought nothing of it and three months later got told it had been accepted it had gone to auction failed come back and then they were like if you're still that bid's still on the table do you want it and I just thought well let's go for it that's that's fate let's go and build mm. this e- utopian uh analog recording studio so that was in 2013 and it opened its doors in 2015 um and initially I didn't even sort of tell anybody it was just all my clients from Manchester because it had been in Manchester beforehand oh, okay. for 10 years um so it was just all my same sort of domino records and um fence records and um rough trade and stuff all the stuff that I would normally be doing um and then it's just built over the years and now built a second um 16 track analog which like I said I was training Elise in and that opens up that analog um experience and and all that comes with it all that I talk about in my film Mm -hmm. um it opens it up at like cheaper than um for 200 pound a day basically with the wow. engineer which is is cheaper than um than the most digital studios and yet the results are like the first the first single that we did out of that and I sort of produced and 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 Elise um kind of engineered was was nominated for was um a boy single that was nominated for single of the year there at the awards and stuff so it just kind of shows you that those those um constraints of 16 tracks um, can you know really yield results um so I just wanted to teach that 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 analog um mindset and session planning to another generation so um thought that the best way to do that was to make it affordable um more affordable than than the twenty four track and me is yeah wonderful well, maybe you could tell us a little bit if, for anyone who is really unfamiliar with analog recording. Um, what do you think that does for the experience of making music, go, making everything with analogue? Um, it makes you completely organised because you have to session plan. You have to. You, the pre-production is really, really important, and I I do free pre-production. I don't charge for attend. I, I prefer not to attend a rehearsal. I prefer to bring the band over or the artist over for like a few hours or half a day or something and go through the songs um, in the live room because the pre-production is everything. You have to have worked out before you start um, how many tracks you, you, you can, you know, so therefore how many mics are you going to put on the drum kit what kind of drum sound are you going to get how many overdubs are there how many backing vocals are there what's the panning you you work out everything for the final mix pretty much before you start recording anything and then you're just following a pattern you're following your notes Mm. through and yeah happy accidents happen and something uh, you know a bit of divine inspiration happens along the way that, that that gets added in but generally you're not going without a route map you have uh, an absolute plan um hour to hour mm-hmm. of how the session's going to play out and in what in uh, and the artist knows that and you've discussed that with the artist and you've discussed how many backing vocals there's going to be and um you know what kind of drum sound it, it's going to be so it all just comes together uh, it comes together really quickly and there's no surprises and there's well there's no you know no head in your hands going this isn't sounding like I expected it to you know you, you kind of know what to expect yeah um so yeah the planning aspect of analog is crucial mm. and then of course on top of that tape is a natural compressor um, you don't need to be going in lightly and adding compression circuitry on top of it because tape will be a beautiful seamless compressor for you anyway. Um, and it enables, uh, I try to work towards um, capturing as many mics in that first live pass as possible. So mm. I tend to try with a, with a basic band, I would get the kit, the bass, uh, amps, 
mic'd up in a different room um, and guide vocals. So I, I might be putting pressing record on somewhere between 12 and 16 mics, um, which means most of your work is done. Wow. And then you're just uh, doing that, you know, you might yeah. do different different amp for the for the guitar solo, backing vocals, real vocals. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of your work's done in that first um, first capture. I also tend to find that that the first um, first one or two, maximum three, playbacks of of them going through the song is the the, the take. So you also capture that feel and that energy, mm. um, as opposed to the 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 boredom that sets in subconsciously if you're going over and over and over doing loads of takes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that magic, it, it's just because the adrenaline's running high, everybody can see each other, it's like a gig, you, you get that whole kind of gig adrenaline, mm. um, maybe a bit more as well, you know, because you know it's being recorded. So just chemically, your body is at full tilt. Um, and that is a very different feel to the kind of relaxed, yeah, give me half of it and I'll cut and paste it into you know, yeah. something else I got earlier. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and how about acoustically? How would you, how do you, have you treated your studio? Um, does it change how you treat it, it being analog? Uh, no, live rooms are live rooms. Yeah. Like, um, and I've, uh, all the rooms are treated. Uh, I have a big 600 square foot live room. Um, and though it, it looks big, um, behind there's, there's no, reflective surfaces in that live room because the size of it itself is is enough but it's very a very meaty reflection because there's nothing top endy um to reflect uh the walls are not plastered i.e and behind the layer of the wall and the ceilings is rubber and felt so it's actually got one pass so if you hit a snare drum in the middle of that room you get the entirety of the meat of the mid-range without any of the top end coming back at you. Mm. So you don't get that high-end ring yeah. to break it down into, you know, you don't get high-end tingy, ringy sounds on things. You just get meat, you get lovely mid-range um, power out of the sounds because of the way the room is structured. Mm. Um, and then in my overdub room is treated with a kind of West Side East Lake concept where um, the four corners of the room are all different treatments. So there's a felted corner that is completely dead. You speak into it and you can only hear your inner body. Mm. Um, and then there's a wood corner and there's a glass and tile mirror corner. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, the, you point the amp or the person or the hi-hat or the snare or whatever it is you're doing this overdub with. Um, in the area that you're you're after yeah you know yeah i love the idea of having these different treatment options on e- each corner of the room yeah it's brilliant it's mm. it's um if you if you look at like the way um like west coast studios the east lake west lake studios were from the 70s um well that concept was brought by 10 cc to strawberry studios and strawberry studios um was like that it had a glass mirror corner it had shag pile corner shag pile carpet corner you know it had mm. very very dead spaces and very 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 super live spaces mm-hmm. and then sort of mediocre wood spaces all in the one room just into different areas of it mm. wonderful that sounds great i mean i can really imagine that's something that you could also play around with at home even yeah um, and if anybody wants any tips on how to do that? I can explain, like how how to Please. set up those those sort of <laughs> you know, c- contact me. And yeah. I'll tell you how to set up West Lake East, like sort of feels in your in your, um, in your project room. Yeah, uh, no, that would be great. Um, or maybe maybe we'll you know in the future do an episode on that. That would be really interesting. Um, it, it does make all the difference, and it is just like having. A palette there to choose from so that when you're looking at your when you're doing overdubs you've got your final stuff together and now you're thinking what do I want out of these backing vocals do I want them harsh do I want them mm. creamy do I want them you know and, and you can just within the same room walk to the area that's going to give you that reflection and mic that reflection you know that's what I mm. teach here when I'm teaching Elise or anyone else I teach them to mic reflection and often I would point something 
at the tile or the, the, the glass and point the mic then for the reflection and not at the actual um, instrument. I would, I would mic the reflection. Mm. And again, it comes back to knowing what's happening from your source, that your source is going into a corner and it's going to ping pong off these two surfaces mm. and, and then angling your mic to catch that reflection, which is a whole different sound to if you just pointed it at where the sound is coming from. Absolutely. And I um, guess that you could you could mic both the reflection and the the sound directly yeah, and then mix yeah. those, couldn't you? Yeah, I do tend to split sounds into um, like creamy and crispy. Mm-hmm. And um, especially like with guitar sounds, I would never just have um, a guitar sound that was that was just sort of one, you know, one one sort of sonic. Yeah. I tend to multi mic for the two different types of sonics so that I have the the different mics would be very different and in different places so that I can EQ one for the for any nice like low end and then one for a very crunchy top or whatever depending on the piece obviously but often like with with like um with electric guitars I would be going in looking for for one to deliver the the, the beauty the, the or what's going on in the low end of, of of the guitar and then one to be delivering um the top and I would almost naturally carve out the middle mm-hmm. because you don't kind of if, if you leave loads of stuff in that middle you'll you'll struggle to place your vocals mm. so you would take a guitar and say well I'll take all its bottom end and I'll take all its top end but I'll naturally leave a space in the middle for for yeah. other stuff and you're kind of in doing that you're obviously then really affecting how much work you have to put in in mixing uh, yeah, aren't you? i can i mix a single in about 45 minutes yeah there's there's nothing to do like there is it's all done at recording yeah amazing um, um well l- maybe we could get on to um your tips then for people going into studios um i mean on girls twiddling knobs i really advocate that people start um experimenting with recording at home but i also really advocate that they combine that with going into studios as well and recording there so yeah. um i'd love to get your tips for musicians who are listening to this and are maybe thinking of in at some time in the future going into a studio what are your top three tips for going in to record their music um it would be preparation um yeah. Uh, yeah i sent you i sent you a tip saying yeah if you do yes. turn up at a studio bring healthy snacks <laughs> don't, yeah don't be having a don't be having a diabetic meltdown because you're yeah. just sat eating rubbish but, <laughs> but like i know that might sound a bit flippant to some people be like oh yeah okay eat bring healthy snacks but obviously that comes from experience julie doesn't it yeah it could yeah it comes from you looking after your mind and body so that you're able to push yourself um to to do a good 12 hour solid day without you know, without losing it. Um, but the most important thing is to be as prepared as possible. So, you know, be excited, but uh, but prepared. So think, use the demo situation to to work on the writing, have it at, at, as, um, as practised as possible mm-hmm. so that it can be, you can kind of really capture that, that magic. Absolutely. Be, you know, certainly with tape, you can punch in a few notes and stuff, but you just want to be able to deliver it with a lot of energy, like yeah. like you were playing it to a packed house gig. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, with that preparation it included in that is that you have gigged your songs in some capacity before you go in the studio, I believe. Because yeah. I think then you really, you have to know your songs well, you know, and you have to be able to play them from start to finish at yeah. the very least and but but uh-huh. I've never gone into a studio without being 100% like known my my material inside out because I've gigged it so many times uh-huh. um and I think that that's meant when I've gone into the studio it's been very like what you've described every single hour I've known what I'm doing you know I know how long yeah. it's probably going to take me to get my vocal down or to get my guitar part down or to you know put that field recording on or whatever it is and I yeah I think the preparation one is really really key and um and yeah. and then you know really strengthening your writing like you say as well um, and practicing mic technique as well practicing mic technique yeah do you have any yeah. tips on how people might do that 
Oh, I am. Um, if people have got a dynamic vocal, I do tend to um, gaffer tape their feet to the floor and um, put them in a, a rocking position where the, the, your, your lead foot forward and you use your hips to move backwards so that you're not stood with your legs, you know, next to each other. It's one in front, one behind. Wow. It enables you to rock from your hips forward and backwards to the mic and learn um, learn that within the dynamic of the song. If you have a dynamic vocal and you always deliver it the same way and it always goes to that loud bit, that epic bit, then make sure that as well as hitting those notes, you also simultaneously have le- learned your mic mm. technique to just lift away. And any strong P's, you know, if you've got really mm. strong P's in, in the lyric, uh, learn to just um, point them away from the mic and just learn the movement like a dance movement so that it just means that when you deliver it, you're not delivering things that are going to be problematic and going to make what was otherwise a great vocal problematic, you know. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. I think um, it's a real art form, isn't it, using a mic well and knowing yeah. how to how to kind of organically, um, it's almost like becoming a part of you. You know, how do you make the mic become a natural part of your performance rather than something you're kind of battling against? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. It's, but it's just in doing that, in keeping the, the level as as consistent, even though the energy of the performance is obviously going up, um, it means that the engineer is less likely to go in with heavy compression. Now, I, I wouldn't anyway. I would mm. teach somebody the mic technique and then it, even if I, if they couldn't even really get it, I would live ride the fader right, through yeah. through the performance so yeah. that I would just knock a few dB off when they go to that part yeah. um, in order that I'm not left with something that needs a load of compression because mm. compression isn't the answer to everything and it does more harm than good to vocals mm-hmm. and you, you need to really try and just deliver as close to to the to an even you know signal mm-hmm. without so that means you know get in and 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 croon on the mic for the bits that you need that emotion and get back mm-hmm. and holler when you need to get back and holler um but don't be expecting to just stand in one spot and a compressor to deal with it because they will deal with it very very badly yeah yeah, yeah. well look um thank you so much for coming on girls twiddling knobs it was so so interesting and but it's also okay. just been great to hear about your journey and, um, you know, what brought you to, to start in your own studio. And I think it's really inspiring. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. No worries. Well, I found it fascinating talking to Julie. It was so interesting hearing about how she started being interested in sound while in hospital as a child and growing up with a father as a mechanic, entering the world of studios in the 70s and 80s, and the discipline and art that goes into recording using analogue technology. If you want to find out more about Julie and her studio, go to analogcat.com, that's analogcat.com. And if you're interested in that mixtape that Julie mentioned, you can find it over at the Bandcamp page, analogcatalog.bandcamp.com, analogcatalog.bandcamp.com. Now, next week, the podcast will fall on another important day in the year, New Year's Eve. And so I'll be bringing you another special guest episode. I'll be sitting down, glass of wine in hand, with Professor Gassia Uzunian, who is one of my favourite ever human beings. And she'll be sharing her top women from music tech history. It's going to be fascinating, inspiring, and I'm pretty sure just a little bit silly. So don't miss this very special New Year's Eve Girls Twiddling Knobs episode. I'll catch you then. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and... More importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.